Yeah. Oh, I, I completely recommend publishing your code. Um, no matter what stage uh, you're at, good, good things will happen if other people look at it. Um, they can make they can make suggestions and, and improvements, and you can be part of something larger. Um, so don't don't be afraid of publishing your code, even if you don't think of yourself as an experienced developer. Hello and welcome to the PyBytes podcast, where we talk about Python, career, and mindset. We're your hosts. I'm Julian Sequeira. And I am Bob Beldebos. If you're looking to improve your Python, your career, and learn the mindset for success, this is the podcast for you. Let's get started. Welcome to the PyBytes podcast. This is Bob, and with me today, I have Will McCugan. Welcome, Will. How are you doing? Hi, Bob. Very well, thank you. Yeah. Got to be here. Recording. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, happy to have you on the show. Um, yeah, I think, I hope by now a lot of people will know your name because of all the exciting stuff you do in the open source uh, space. And um, mm. yeah, everybody's uh, doing rich in the terminal by now, hopefully. But maybe for the people that don't know you yet, maybe you want to introduce you to our audience quickly? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm a, an open source developer. That's how most people in the Python community know me um, from a library called Rich for generating nice, pretty content in the terminal. But um, I've been doing open source for, for many years. And right now I'm the CEO and founder of Textualize, which is a, a startup that's based on my open source work. Awesome. And uh, do you have a win of the week? Always start with wins. Um, well, I think software development is all about little wins. If you don't um, count them, then it can get a bit depressing. Uh, uh, yesterday, I optimized some code, which was nice. Um, I realized I was doing an expensive operation twice. And this was for every uh, widget in the textual app. And I reduced that to doing that expensive operation once, and it got faster. And it was quite nice because it was rel relatively little code um but had like a measurable speed up um so i'd call that a win yeah that must mm. be a satisfying yeah especially mm. if you hit those speed gains nice nice mm. honestly i cannot think of a win of mine so i'm going to skip on that for now <laughs> and also to just dive in so uh first i wanted to ask you how did you first get into python uh were you already a developer before uh what what is your story um, yeah, so I've been a developer for you know my entire career, twenty five plus years, um, and I I started out in video games, and video games at that time were written in C plus um, plus, but we often used like a scripting language to add um, simple logic to the game. So you don't want to write all your logic in C plus plus; you can use a more kind of friendly language. Um, and I was investigating scripting languages to add to a C++ game engine that I was working on. And I went through them all. I went uh, Ruby uh, and then Python and Lua and, and some others. And I actually settled on Lua because it was um, better designed for sort of integration with the, with the game engine. That's kind of what it was built for. Um, but that gave me exposure to Python. And I found myself uh, returning to Python um, to write tools and things. And those tools gradually got larger and larger, and I started writing more Python than C++. And I got to a point where I just liked Python much better. Um, you know, I've been learning C++ for years. I was, I was very good at it, but it was still a headache to write because it's it's a very low-level language, and it's so easy to to break things. Um, so yeah, I just kind of determined to like move my career into Python. Uh, and eventually I did. Uh, my first pure Python job was working for the Internet Chess Club, uh, writing a chess interface. And ever since then, it's been you know predominantly Python that I work on. Nice. And um, I think you alluded to what you like about Python, the, the easiness, cleanness. Um, yeah, you said C++ things can go wrong. So what, what appealed mm. uh, initially to you? Um, yeah, the memory safety. Because um, with C++, it's very easy to write things to memory that you're not supposed to, and things blow up. Uh, Python was memory safe. 
and uh, also just so it was expressive you know it, it took less time for you to build what you wanted to build um it didn't run fast you know it's, it's still it's not as fast as c plus plus um but i consider that a worthy sacrifice because i could build the thing i wanted uh in a in a fraction of the time yeah it's often said right it's not the fastest language but then the developer time you save that's that's the real benefit right yeah absolutely um and most of the time it doesn't matter how fast python runs because it runs fast enough um so yeah I'm, i I, I love python um i'd go into other languages if i needed that speed up um you know c or 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 rust um but i honestly find very little reason to do that um it just seems to run fast enough um maybe not initially um, but after a few rounds of optimization um we found that python is just pretty much fast enough cool and uh one trend you mentioned already like you did that big interface project um there's also the ignored terminal <laughs> i read on your site so there's definitely a yeah a trend in your work with interfaces terminal so yeah what what inspired you to create rich and textual what what's the backstory um so rich was first um many years ago um i wrote something which was kind of like the prototype for rich um it was called console and it was part of another another project and it was just kind of like a repository for all the kind of terminal related stuff um but it, it worked really well and the design that I came up with i often thought well that'd be great if i could uh, factor that out into another another library um and i sat on it for years just in, in the back of my head um that i want to build this thing one day and then I just, um, a few years later, I started it. Um, it came together uh, quite well. Um, and, you know, it, it fit my needs. And then I posted it on on GitHub and it just kind of took off. Um, I think people wanted this for a long time, probably without knowing that, that they wanted it, but they wanted it. Um, there was lots of libraries to do terminal stuff out there, um, but they didn't work together. So you can um, put wrap text inside a table and then a progress bar um, because there were different libraries and they didn't know about each other. So I built something where uh, it was all composable. You could put these things together in, in any combination you liked. And I think that's what made it made it popular in that you don't have to assemble a whole bunch of disparate libraries um, that don't work well together. You can just have one complete system. Um, so yeah, and just I published it and it and it took off, and um, that kind of led on to textual um, a little bit later. Um, Rich is kind of for static content that you display in the terminal. You've got like a scroll back buffer, but it wasn't dynamic. Um, it wasn't designed for keyboard and mouse and in interactivity. But I saw some people doing that. They would take Rich. And then they'd use some other library for keyboard and mouse and build apps out of it. And I realized how much potential that had. The um the previous libraries to do this were based on libraries that came out of the 90s and they hadn't moved on a great deal. And if you wanted to build one of these apps inside the terminal, you had to be very, very motivated because you had to work around lots of ar archaic stuff to get anything working. So I built textual which um, it kind of borrowed techniques from the web world because I was a web developer for 15 years. And I built that into a library for building these apps inside the terminal. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. Um, Textual is it's, um, not finished. It's probably not gonna be finished for uh, a long time, but it's very stable and I'm you know, really happy that people are building things with it. Yeah, amazing. So could you say like, especially that, that web background that you bring that web, development experience and, and the way we build web apps into the terminals, making the terminal mm. much richer. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, people have been working on frameworks for, for the web for really hard, for lots of different companies and open source projects for like two decades. And they made lots of advancements. Um, but none of that was, was coming back to the, the terminal. The, the terminal just kind of overlooked. But a lot of these advancements are equally ap applicable to terminals. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to like take the 
cherry pick the things which I think worked very well uh, and essentially port them to the terminal. And the first thing I did was CSS. Uh, I mean, it, people thought that was kind of perverse at the time. And it's like, why would you want CSS in the terminal? But it, it served the same purpose as CSS in the browser. It separates the logic um, from the presentation. And it was a much cut down version of CSS. So it's not like uh, I'm supporting all the browser can do. Um, I would just build a, a CSS syntax and rules, which would expose things you need uh, in the terminal. So it was much, much cut down. And built other things in as well, um, reactivity. So if you want to update something in textual, we just modify um, essentially an attribute and the interface updates automatically. So that's what makes it like easier to use than the kind of previous generation of terminal libraries like curses. Now, interesting. And yeah, are there any other or specific features, capabilities of the tools that you're most proud or proud or excited about? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, with textual, there's all sorts of cool things. I really like the live editing. Um, so you can you separate the Python code from the CSS code, and you can make modifications to the CSS code, uh, and the interface updates accordingly which makes it very fast to iterate. I mean, if you had to change your Python code, exit the app, run it again, get to that same state, that'd be quite a laborious process. Um, but with CSS, you can uh, update things very, very quickly and iterate very quickly. So that's, that's one feature I'm very proud of. Nice. And I also have a more generic question. How do you approach complex problems when building those tools? Because there's some stuff we see in these terminal apps that you're doing like, like, wow, how, how does he even do it? Right. So there's a lot of design and complexity involved. So how, how do you approach complex uh, new features or bugs even? Um, hmm. How do you go about that? Um, essentially, it's a, a divide and conquer strategy, um, com you know, Things are complex, not because they're big, but because they're built of like lots of smaller problems. And when you divide a big problem into smaller problems, they become more manageable. So essentially that, you know, um, when I was building the, the CSS, you separate that into a, a parser, something which generates an abstract model. And then you have something which takes the styles and then renders them. So when you, when you break it down into lots of little pieces, um, it becomes more manageable. It's less less magical and less scary. It's just a, a collection of much smaller problems. And that's applicable to just about any code that anyone writes. Also applicable to life, I think. <laughs> if, you, if you have a big problem, <laughs> break it into smaller problems and tackle those independently. Yeah, yeah, analytical mm. thinking. Uh, but also, yeah, there's the... Um... Software best practices go a long way then, right? Like, mm. as you say, like I make a parser that I really, oh, and I'm going to embed this new feature, intermingle it in some code. Now I'm going to build an, a reusable class, like as a simple example, right? And if yeah. you apply already that that structured thinking, then I guess it becomes easier. Yeah, ex exactly. Then your mental model should match your code. And if you break it up into smaller pieces like that and just use best practices, um, classes to do what ideally one thing uh, and then it just kind of falls into place and that mostly comes with experience i guess right like if you have been developing software from for many years yeah. now right um it, it does um you know experience doesn't make you smarter um but it just means you've got a large repertoire of solutions that you can pick from that you, you didn't have to like uh think through every time um so that's that's why you know Experience is good. Talent is good, um, but experience compounds <laughs> the talent and you, you can work around, I mean, I do, I, I work around um, a lack of talent by, you know, <laughs> using my experience, basically having failed many times and, and eventually come up with solutions which I can apply again to future problems. Yeah, that's interesting. You say that it's, there's a lot of mindset involved there as well, right? Here, here, hmm. Julian, Julian would normally come in, the other Pybytes co-founder, and uh, hmm. that's that's all the mindset, right? Like, uh, if you fail more, then you progress faster. But you know, a lot of people struggle with this, like, oh, what will they think about my code? Should they even publish it as open source? Uh, hmm. That can be tricky, right? Yeah. Oh, I I completely recommend publishing your code, um, no matter what stage 
uh, you're at. Good, good things will happen if other people look at it. Um, they can make they can make suggestions and, and improvements, and you can be part of something larger. Um, so don't don't be afraid of publishing your code, even if you don't think of yourself as an experienced developer. No one's going to, you know, be insulting about it. Um, they'll probably be complimentary. It's like you know, tackle something and see what you can build. Yeah. Thanks for the permission. <laughs> and if anything, if if you get some critique, then you will learn from it, right? So it comes back again to like failing. Well, it's not even failing, but like, you know, the the yeah. faster you get feedback, mm. the better, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think of it as iterating. Iterating. Um, oh. Not not failing per se. Yeah. Yeah. Start your year with a Python breakthrough at PyBytes. Escape tutorial paralysis and jump into practical, just-in-time learning. Our personalized coaching beats imposter syndrome and sharpens your Python skills. Join our PyBytes community, a network where passionate developers grow together. Whether you're a beginner or leveling up, we tailor the journey to your pace. Visit pybytesdevelopermindset.com now. This year, transform into the confident, in-demand Python developer you're meant to be. Your Python mastery begins today with PyBytes. Check out the link in the description below. Talking about iterating, uh, textual, uh, you can say it went from hobby to business, right? You said it was mm. a company now. So can you talk a bit about that transition, how that was? Yeah, sure. Um, so I founded Textualize, which is the company behind Textual, um, two years ago now, almost two years ago. Um, I decided to take a year off. I was going to live off of savings and I would build Textual and then I would build this web service behind it, which I could uh, commercialize. And then, then I would seek uh, investment. Um, that was that was plan A, uh, but plan B was I, I talked to um, a VC called Costanoa. Uh, they specialize in, in open core uh, projects. So open core companies are a company that has some open source code and they have some other uh, service which connects to the open source code uh, which they can commercialize from so it's kind of a compromise between um you know open source and capitalism so yeah i was able to hire three other developers uh, so now we're a team of four developers working um three of us here in edinburgh and one in portugal and it's a very good team and um, it's come together very nicely Wow, amazing. So now you not only write the code, but you also have to steer or guide the other developers, right? Yeah, um, which is not too bad. Um, they're all experienced developers. They got, you know, their own own skill sets. Um, the type of person that gets nerd sniped, you know, you give them you give them a problem, um, they're they're gonna solve it. Um, whether they want to or not, you know, it's just like a compulsion. Like here's a problem, like they'll they'll have to solve it. Um, so yeah, it doesn't take that much work to manage a team. It is a small team at the moment. So I consider myself to be, well, my main role as a developer, just like the other guys. Um, part of my time is taken up by organizing tasks and uh, keeping things up to date. But other than that, I'm just a developer or a code monkey is my preferred title. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. I recognize that pull. You have to solve it. It's a yeah. strength, but also a weakness that in the mm -hmm. sense that you, you have to stop sometimes. Yeah, uh, talking about um, challenging things, uh, what has been some of the yeah most challenging things you had to do on one, one of these projects or in your software career overall? Have you even felt like giving up coding altogether at some point? Like, I feel like giving up coding every time I reach a, a bug that takes more than half an hour. <laughs> um, it can be very frustrating. Um, software development in general, it, it's, you know, I haven't really, I enjoy being a software developer, uh, ultimately, even though there's points of frustration, I, I enjoy it. Um, I think my biggest challenge is when I was when I became CEO and it's in this site, the part of the, the role, which is not software development, um, talking to lawyers and, and accountants. And, and and VCs and that kind of thing. Um, that was not in my skill set previously. You know, um, it's just me sitting in front of a laptop writing code, generally. Um, so those are the biggest challenges I think I faced 
um, just um, doing the kind of business side, the managing money and, and legal things and um, employment law. <laughs> Um, you'd be you'd be amazed how much of that there is just with a small company of like four people. But there you go. Yeah, I know we we see that with Pybytes as well. Like uh, mm. there was one time where we were just sitting in our dungeons writing code, and that's still what we love to do. And now all of a sudden it's a business. Yeah. And there's so many more things, and also things that make you a little bit uncomfortable, and you know you have to learn. And things say like, well, the coding was actually relatively simple. I was frustrating at that mm. bug, but this mm -hmm. is a whole new game, right? So uh, yeah. yeah. The thing about code is um, you have all the solutions and all the problems and you feel like even if you haven't got it now, you know, with enough effort, you can solve it using the knowledge that you've got. Um, but other the business side, um, you've got to go out and find that knowledge and you don't often know where or who to ask. Um, so you're left with this kind of feeling that um, you're not capable in, in yourself of solving it. You have to go and find that knowledge or find the right people to ask. And, and that's challenging. Yeah. With programming, there's a brute force aspect, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, get... you, you, you know, you will be able to solve it eventually with, with enough effort. Yeah. Yeah. But this is more about you put in the effort, but am I, am I even going in the right direction? Right. Uh, where do I even find the answers? Exactly. Exactly. And sometimes it takes, um, actually just like in the early days when you're learning coding, you, you, you sometimes you go down a path and you realize, oh, that's not working out. You go, you go to backtrack and try again. Um, so yeah, we're back to iterating. It's the same thing really. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Getting to a state where you ask the right questions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So coder, developer, entrepreneur, um, that must be pretty tough on your schedule. So any, uh, any advice for a sound work-life balance, uh, which I hope you have. Yeah. Um, I really struggled with this. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I was wanting to take that year off was to de-stress. Um, I had a, a contracting job and it wasn't probably the, the most stressful. Um, but it's the stress just kind of build up. Um, but then, you know, when I founded textualize and there was just extra stress i found myself uh working every hour where i was conscious uh, I, I was working and then if, if i wasn't working i was worried about you know whatever i was going to be working on the next day um i think to to kind of like work around that you have to set boundaries um i, I said no coding in the evening and i started doing that just a, just a few months ago uh, that was beneficial because I would, I would code in the evening and then I'd be, I wouldn't sleep well and then I'd be tired the next day. And so it, it feels like it's a productivity hack working in the evening. There's the two or three hours in the evening. Um, but in actual fact, I think it was kind of, um, it was kind of a negative productivity because I'd be tired the next day. So I think, I think that's, I think that's what the work-life balance is about. It's like setting boundaries. Um, you can still work very hard and then still have some downtime to, to relax and, you know, and enjoy a meal. I think that's important. Yeah, that, that's a great tip because when you work on your business, right, it can, it's almost like water flowing wherever it can go, right? You're constantly yeah. working on it. And if you don't set the boundaries, it's, it's just, there's it always more work, right? And yeah, there's an infinite amount of work ahead of you. Um, so you, you know, you're not going to fix it by spending a couple of hours after dinner. Yeah, and York is also not only the business because these projects are so popular right now, and and there's so many, you know, there's so many issues and and things happening on GitHub. So it, mm. I guess is is your team now there? Can you delegate that to the team, or or is the open source community really also um, taking care of part of that maintenance work for you? Um, they are, yeah. So obviously, the you know the team's full time; they can put in the most work. Um, but we do have a number of people who just um, like what we do and, and they're contributing and they're, you know, helping each other out, which is terrific. Uh, we do our support through Discord, um, but sometimes there's not a textualized dev there to, to help. Um, but some other developers who are just building stuff with textual will jump in and, and help others. And they'll do, do the same thing with issues. So it is, um, it is a big advantage. I think it's a big um business advantage you've certainly you've kind of got like a, a big pool of developers who are working for free you know um 
I, I, I can't, I don't know of any other industry where people will just volunteer their, their time uh, to, you know, essentially help a business. I mean, the textual is open source, so everyone can benefit from it and add, add to it. And um, everyone benefits, which is fantastic. Yeah, it's amazing. Definitely something unique <laughs> for this mm. space. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, so what's coming next? Any any are there any future Python developments um you're gonna leverage in your work? There's now this trend with Rust speeding things up and mm. being built in to certain libraries like Palintic. There's AI. Um what's any any cool things you you're planning on integrating? Um yeah, I don't think we're gonna be we did think about doing speed ups in C and Rust, um, but we got it working so fast in, in raw Python that we're thinking that there's probably not much benefit. Um, I am going to try AI. Um, you know, but two years ago, it's amazing how fast tech moves, but two years ago, I thought of having a, a no code slash low code approach uh, where you could write a YAML file and you give it the specifications like the layout and then the widgets and it would build interface without any code. But now that I think that's been replaced by AI, I think we can do something um, better with AI. So you could, you know, say, um, dock a header to the top, um, add a panel to the left, um, bind that to the T key to, to hide it, that kind of thing. And then the AI would just generate the, the Python and the CSS. So I think that's the next thing we're going to tackle. And I'm quite excited about that. That sounds amazing. <laughs> cool. So you're also a humanist photographer, runner. Uh, so maybe you want to share a bit about these, these uh, passions, hobbies and uh, how they, well, I guess they balance mm. that. That's probably obvious, but maybe also mm. how they inspire you with the work and the coding. Sure. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't call myself a runner anymore. Um, it's unfortunate, but I got a slip disc in my back. So I, I can't run that, put an end to my running career. Um, the photography, I, I love photography. I haven't had a chance to do it since, since textual cause I've been so busy. Um, but I'm definitely gonna take that up again. Um, I was very excited about wildlife photography. Uh, I did some trips around the world. I, I took pictures of bears in Finland and Komodo dragons in, in Indonesia and that that's my passion really if i get the chance to travel again that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna take my big lens and take pictures of amazing animals um yeah so i'm a humanist and um, that just means someone with a non-religious worldview um with a focus on uh human beings as as for ethics and morality and that does kind of like influence my worldview and and my politics i guess Interesting. Cool. Yeah, I hope you get some time back for the photography. Yeah, yeah one day. We always end with reading and books. What are you reading at the moment? Um, or if you're not reading anything interesting at the moment, what, what book would you like to recommend to the audience? Um, I started reading um, Interview with a Vampire. Um, I always liked the movie, the really old one with, with um, was it Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. Uh, and then there was a, there was a show... Um, based on interview with a vampire that I saw recently. And uh, yeah, so I thought I'll just, I'll pick it up um, and on my Kindle and start reading it. And so far I'm quite enjoying it. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't read much tech books. I think I used to, I used to have a library of tech books, um, tons, <laughs> tons of them, huge, huge volumes, like really thick, but <laughs> uh, you know, um, you buy by the pound. Um, but nowadays I just try to, to read fiction, to just relax on my. Yeah, similar story here. Um, they're really good books, but sometimes also like you read a whole bunch of stuff about something you're not immediately implementing. And PyBytes, we always say like jet learning, right? Just just in time learning. So yeah, you're probably just going to look up the docs and like ChatGPT to really get you the resource you need as you're coding. So sometimes, mm -hmm. although these books are great, it just you just overload yourself with a lot of information, and you might not apply it and then forget it right? yeah. I, I think that's right i think um books are great for getting a, a grounding um you know a, a foundational base for your knowledge um but i think once you've got a bit of experience um you know where to go to get 
and the information. So if you're working on a particular library or a particular technique, you can uh, look it up on the web or, or buy a book then uh, when you need it. Um, so I, I still love books and I still love uh, tech books. Um, but yeah, I like the idea of just in time uh, learning. You learn a thing that you need uh, when you need it. Yeah, I'm curious though, like, do you do you embrace AI tools? Do you use ChatGPT a lot in your work? Um, I have, and for some things, it's it's terrific. Um, Darren, one of uh, the guys I work with, uh, he he's very good at ChatGPT, and it's it's helped us um, get things up and running. But I found that it generates very poor code um, for you know tasks which are don't don't need the grunge work. Uh, the more specific tasks, it will generate poor code that doesn't doesn't run um i think it's getting better though um which concerns me as a developer uh and i think i'll be using it more and more in the future um but i don't think it's there yet i don't think it's um it's the best you know it's not a developer in itself it's a, it's a tool which you can use to get up and running quickly but i think there's still plenty of room for experienced developers Luckily, yeah. But yeah, mm. somebody was saying like, uh, yeah, it's true. It spits out wrong answers from time to time, but also less so, I think. But then it's also becoming smarter, like exponentially. And that's really, yeah. not that I'm worried per se, but it, it is something we might not just see how far that can get in one, two, three years, five years, right? And Yeah, it is moving very fast. And I think our, our jobs um, are going to change. Um, I think we'll still have jobs. I think there'll still be plenty of jobs for engineers out there but how we do our daily work um is going to change dramatically when the ai gets so much better and, and you're right to say that it, it will uh the speed this i mean it's like two years ago i barely heard of you know ais that wrote code for you um so i think in another two years it's going to be so much so much better and we're going to be using that rather than writing code in an ide Exciting times, but also we have to see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I much enjoyed uh, our conversation. Is there any final uh, call to action um, you would have for our audience, uh, mainly Python developers, of course, and the best way to connect with you? Um, yeah, you check out our projects. Um, you go to www.textalize.io. Uh, you'll find links there. Um, you can join our Discord channel where you can talk to me and other developers on Textual, um, or you can follow me on Twitter. Um, and I, I do like in, engaging with other people in the community. Um, so yeah, I hope to see uh, your listeners there. Awesome. So yeah. now uh, Fostadon, you're still on Twitter or? Oh, well, I, am, I, am I am on Fostadon, yeah. I mean, I, I want to move away, but there's just so many people still on Twitter. Yeah, um, yeah if you Google me, you'll, you'll find me on Fostadon. Not Fostadon, um, social.mastodon, I can't remember. <laughs> so some Mastodon instance, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, if you Google it, you'll probably find it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Will. Um, again, really enjoyed it. And and yeah, thanks for all you do. It's just impressive. And uh, yeah, uh, coming back to that mm. humanist standpoint, you're helping a lot of people. So it's really inspiring. So thanks for mm. all you do. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this episode. To hear more from us, go to pybyte slash friends. That is pybit.es slash friends and receive a free gift just for being a friend of the show. And to join our thriving community of Python programmers, go to pybytes slash community. That's pybit.es forward slash community. We hope to see you there and catch you in the next episode.